Federal lawmakers will go back to work with that list of unfinished business. Illinois Congressman Eric Sorensen will be in the middle of those debates. He joins us for a conversation this morning. Welcome back to the program. Good to be with you, Jim. Well, you're still technically a newbie on Capitol Hill. Right. How much different does it feel, though, going into your second year now that you have the first year under your belt? Well, I think the, uh, the first year, a lot of what a new member of Congress has to do is sit down and listen. Um, not just listen to the people who have been there before, but also listen to the freshmen on the other side of the aisle. Find out what are the ways that we can work together. And then now in this next year, in 2024, we need to see results. Um, the training wheels are off. Uh, we have to understand that, you know, here we are about a little over two weeks away from a possible government shutdown again. Uh, we're going to need a budget passed. We need the appropriations process to work. And so that's what we're going to do uh, feet first here uh, in the new week. Well, let's get into some of those divisive issues. The House and Senate went on the holiday break without a deal to provide more support for Israel and Ukraine and their wars. Uh, House Republicans wouldn't go along without a commitment for more security along the border with Mexico. They seem to have leverage on this issue. How do you expect this to be resolved? Uh, look, I mean, that was one of the most unfortunate things, and um, I, I was upset uh, when I left for holiday break uh, with this um, unfinished business to leave Ukraine in the lurch, um, understanding that, um, Jim, when we get briefed as members of Congress all the time on things that are being developed uh, in, in the Middle East and also in, in Ukraine. The problem that I have is in the last session uh, where we're being briefed by the, the, the Defense Secretary, the Secretary of State, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that largely it was only Democrats that showed up to understand. Um, I'm not giving anything away when I say that if we leave Ukraine, um, Russia will take over. This, is, this isn't an if. Russia will take over. They will go to Estonia and, and into a NATO ally of ours, and then we will have to have troops fighting a nuclear-powered Russia. We have to do everything in Ukraine, uh, so that does not happen. Do you feel there's a sense of urgency from the Republicans to go along now? I hope so. You know, now I hope that cooler heads will prevail. Um, I, I hope that we can tackle the border crisis, and it is one. Um, these are two separate issues, but we've got to understand that the people that elected us, they want us to solve multiple issues at the same time. We can do that. I'm going to get back to the border in a moment. Let's finish with Ukraine, because is this relief from the United States now, whenever it comes, enough to matter at this point? Um, I, I do believe so. I mean, look, a lot of what's going to Ukraine, and even from here in the Quad Cities, technology that is going to Ukraine, it is largely the seconds in our military that we are replacing with the firsts. Uh, it is older technology that is surplused that we're giving away to Ukraine. We're they're seeing tremendous success in Ukraine, not having an army before this even started to see where they are today. Um, also, we're hearing just in the past few days at the fact that there are some North Korean um, ordinances that are now being used uh, by Russia into Ukraine. We have to make sure that we see it through and Ukraine has its sovereignty in the end. Because of all these issues now being intertwined, let's get back to the border because the activity at the border isn't just right. a Republican talking point anymore. Republican governors in those southern states I will argue carried out a brilliant political strategy by sending migrants north to northern cities with Democrats as mayors. And now you have mayors in Chicago and New York City complaining to the Biden administration about the pressure that they're feeling on those cities. Mm -hmm. What policy changes do you support when it comes to the border and immigration? Well, you just said it, Jim. It's a political strategy. Um, we have to but understand. It's a real issue, too. It's not just. It, it's an absolutely real issue. And the unfortunate part of this is politics is coming into play here. Um, talking with the mayor of Rockford, um, at what they had to do such to, to ensure safety um, in Rockford as that plane of 350 migrants came to the city and then they were just dumped off with one set of clothes. These are real people that we're dealing with. And because these are real people, we need real problems, not political stunts. All right, well, let's get to Israel's war against Hamas because this is another flashpoint here. Democrats are divided on supporting the country. Members of Congress like Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Bernie Sanders are extremely critical of Israel's assault on Gaza. This after being attacked by Hamas, a terrorist organization right. itself. How much should the United States be telling Israel how to defend itself? Uh, look, 
I mean, what's going on in Gaza is is atrocious. I'm um, seeing the the pictures of what's going on to the innocent people in Gaza. That's not Hamas. Uh, Hamas is different from the innocent people in, in Gaza, and we have to understand that. And I do believe that there needs to be more pressure on Netanyahu to do the right thing uh, because of the fact that so many innocent people are hurt. Uh, we need to make sure as, as an ally of not just Israel, but as members of one humanity, that we're expediting the humanitarian aid um, such that the people in Gaza are going to be able to live in safety, not underneath uh, the tight grip of Hamas. Didn't we see the people in Gaza rejoice after October 7th? Not just Hamas, but the people there because they've lived under Hamas rule. So are they not supporting Hamas in its own way? I mean, way? I mean you could say the same thing up in Lebanon with Hezbollah. Hezbollah runs the schools, they run the fire department, the police department, the hospitals, mm -hmm. the electric company. And they're both funded by Iran. Right. And so what, what we need to make sure happens here is that the people have the ability to have a democratic election so that they can vote uh, for the people that are going to best uh, have their uh, you know, they're back in all of this, but also we need to make sure that Israel is, is secure, um, that the, the bombs that are flying across the border into Israel, they have to be stopped as well. Um, but I think we have to have a long-term strategy, and I have really yet to see that even from the Israeli well, government. Well, that's been an argument that's gone on for decades between these two sides, right? Right. I mean, we, we were close to it. Um, you know, we were close to it with uh, Saudi Arabia coming to the table with Israel um, to join forces. Um, I think we need more of that going in the future, but the problem here is, uh, with this botched effort by Netanyahu, um, is this something that actually can be done, and it remains to be seen. Let's get to one more topic, because you alluded to it earlier in our conversation, the threat of that looming government shutdown. Right. Uh, we got used to Congress kicking the can down the road by setting a new deadline. Now we've got two deadlines, January 19th and mm -hmm. February 2nd, after the last continuing resolution. Uh, cautious optimism is the word out of Washington for a real budget agreement. Uh, Republicans are pushing for cuts of about $70 billion in non-military spending. And then there's the Unpredictable Freedom Caucus, a minority but influential group of Republicans. We've seen how they've acted in the past. What are you hearing from leadership at this point? Are those spending cuts on the table? Well, we need to make sure that, you know, I, I think, you know, even the Democratic Caucus, you know, we would say we need to find government waste um, where we can find it. We need to cut it out. Uh, there is so much of, of the budget um, that just goes poof into, into thin air. We don't know where it goes. We need to make sure that the right things are funded. But also, for instance, my work in the Agriculture Committee, we can't take food assistance away. Um, that's not waste. And right now the other side wants to take SNAP benefits and cut them in half. Um, they want to take the food assistance away from people as people are still struggling to make ends meet. And so we need to make sure that we're fighting so that, that the waste as we find it gets cut out, but where it is needed where it gets used, it stays in. But the climate issues, which I know you're passionate about, let's say promoting more electric vehicles, for example, and building that super highway, cannot be phased in on a longer period of time rather than putting so much money up front. Right, I, and I think so. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, the provisions there, um, that was in the last Congress. Um, but what we, we've got to make sure it doesn't happen today is that the money doesn't get raided from what was done in the 117th Congress to pay for the cuts in the 118th Congress. Because if we go down that road, which is something that has never happened before, uh, then we run the risk of being able to, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul. And that's not how legislating should be done. We need to come up with a budget, stick to that budget year by year. And also we do need to look at the deficit and make sure that we're cutting the deficit so that we're not leaving this, um, this bill on our kids and our grandkids. I'm a Congressman Eric Sorensen. Thanks for the conversation as always. Good luck with everything in D.C. Thank you, Jim.